Hello again, and today we are answering questions about designing a board game. So let's just jump right into it. First question, can you talk about your design process? Where did you start? Ah, okay, well, with Oros, it started on a pizza box. To be honest, uh, the whole the whole thing started with a pizza box that had been left over from the night before. I took the box and a Sharpie and I literally just cut out tiles. I drew a map on the box. I took some extra scraps of paper and a pen and made up some little card things. And that's that was the first prototype that I had put together. And I literally sat on the, my living room floor and I played all four players. I'd stand up and move to the next player, the next player. And I'd play through uh, the whole game, try, just trying out like, oh, what? What about this idea? What about this idea about, you know, every every couple of turns, I'd change the rules, try a new thing, change the rules, try a new thing. And I probably actually did that, oh, eight or nine times before I said, okay, I think this is working good enough. Let's let's try it on someone else. And, you know, wrangled my wife in or wrangled my neighbor in or a friend in to try and play it and break it. And uh, so really the, the beginnings of the process were, playing with just cardboard and, and scraps of paper and making edits on the fly and, you know, testing new things out like right there in the game until things started to really start click into place a little bit more, started to get solidified and working a little bit more um, before moving on uh, to more advanced things. But anyway, there, there you go. That's where it all started. Next question. Was there a specific moment when you knew your concept would work? Ah, well, I think at least in the terms of Oros, and really I should add this caveat that all these questions are through the lens of designing just Oros because it is my very first design. It's the very uh, first board game I've ever worked on and developed um, and, and put together myself. So um, take that with a bias because there are definitely probably lots of different approaches, a lot of different experiences that people have had. Um, for, for Oro specifically, I think the very first time I saw tiles shift off the map and come in on the other side or shift around the edges of the map, uh, that was one of those moments where I was like, oh, there's something here. There's, there's a game in here that's going to be amazing. Um, and so that was probably one of those moments, but that was like when it first started. I don't know if there's really moments along the way where I said, oh, like click light bulb moment or something like that, where I said, now it's going to work for sure. Um, but probably as I did play test, seeing people's reactions and, and, and watching, uh, their reactions as they played, because you could see the gears are also turning in their heads. They were having the same type of effect that it, that has on me when I, when I first was thinking about all this stuff. Um, and they said, you know, when people would say, oh, wow, yeah, this is, this is something. So maybe, maybe many moments along the way. I don't know. Next question. How do you determine the mechanic mechanisms that help you implement the theoretical ideas of your game? Who? Okay, there's a lot to unpack inside those big words. Okay, so this question assumes that you have a theoretical ideas, right? You've got some concept in your mind of how of the game you want to have happen and and things that you want to occur during your game, and you now need to make decisions about which mechanics to choose to make that happen. And how do you know which mechanics are going to be better uh, than other mechanics? Um, and that's a really, really tough question, I think, to answer because I mean, it's always, of course, it's, uh, of course, it's dependent on the game that you're developing. It's going to be different no matter what. But I, I feel like uh, designing uh, designing a board game is much like well, it uses the scientific method, right? You 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 start with a hypothesis, then you create an experiment that you carry out and at the tail end of that, you get results, you kind of, you review what happened and then you make a new hypothesis and you do that again and again and again and again and again as you slowly hone in and you slowly uh, figure out exactly what does work, what doesn't work and 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 push it, I think, to its, to its limits and try things out that, you know, probably don't work sometimes and try things out that really do work. And you say, okay, oh, that, that part I definitely need to, to, to keep. So if you have a theoretical idea, I think it's a matter of like testing different game mechanics and trying different things out. Um, because I think just sitting on the sidelines, thinking about it probably won't get you there. You, you have to actually build the physical thing and start playing with it to find out if it's actually going to, to lead to the outcome that you were hoping for. Next question is, which came first, the mechanics or the theme? Well, for, you know, I think some people do start with a theme, right? They're just really excited about some sort of concept and then they 
try to build a game around it with Oros. It definitely started with mechanics and then a little bit of theme and then some mechanics and then infusion of theme. And actually much of the theme began to dictate many of the mechanics as things became more complex and layered and, and developed. Uh, it was definitely an interplay between the two. So I don't think there was like a, I have a finished game, now I need to skin it type of uh, moment. Really, uh, everything's integrated together. The, the theme drives and, and explains why the mechanics are happening, but it also wouldn't exist if the mechanics weren't there in the first place. So uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. I don't know. I don't know if there's a way to say this started it or this, uh, this came first or this came last. I don't know. All right, next question. Do you set up rules first or go off general ideas and thoughts before uh, you make a, a play or, or a prototype? You know, I, I, of all of the, the game designs and prototypes and game designers that I've met and, and played their games with, I don't know any of them that's ever started with a rule book and said, I wrote up a rule book. Now we're going to try the game. I think the game always comes first. That, that might be an assumption. I don't know, but usually what's going on is like the scientific method, you have a hypothesis and then you test it. That's what a play test is. And then you make changes or you make a new hypothesis and you, and you do it again and again and again. And then after all of that said and done, then you have a pretty good idea of what the rules need to be or uh, what, you know, the boundaries of the system and uh, you know, where, where we need guardrails and where we need freedoms and, and the interplay between those two things. And so usually the rule book comes way, I think way later. Um, down the road, especially as you start to really dial in um, and find out edge cases where, oh, wow, we need way more governance on that one thing, or we need to be more lenient on this thing. Uh, and, and that only comes through playing the game and, and figuring it out and seeing what happens as people interact with it, especially different you know, people think differently. Every, every person thinks differently. So every new person that plays the game, they approach it a different way and that's new insights. So I, it, it kind of changes based on who's playing it and the, and the feedback you get. Next question. What have you found to be the most challenging? Whew. Okay. I think, and this is the same probably with any creative endeavor, I think uh, the most challenging thing is often uh, letting go and pushing beyond your, your first instinct. And the, and the very first thing that you that you try to do. So often we we have an idea and we say, oh, that's a really smart idea. And and we implement it and then we hold on to it because it was ours, right? It was our idea and it's precious. And uh, um, because it came from us, we created it. And so we have this love for it. And often those are really great because it pushes us to new conclusions. But when things become more developed, we when you return back to those things, those, those initial ideas, they they sometimes end up blocking the progress the that you need to to have in order to keep the game going or or keep the creative endeavor fresh or interesting and, and those favorite things end up being the blockers and it's really difficult i think to separate yourself from those uh those types of ideas like your favorite thing um and to recognize that um just because it's not good now doesn't make you not good and you know you and the idea are not the same thing that you're actually separated and and figuring out how to let go of those things is i think the very first step and then also then being empowered to figure out well then if it's not that then what is it and and i think that's really challenging to then push through that barrier of unknown where you where you enter, you step into something new and you try something new. So really a lot of it's a, you know, it's it's believing in yourself enough to act, but not so much that you become blind to the flaws. All right, next question. What is your approach to playtesting? What data are you looking for? Are you looking for more emotional responses or smooth mechanics? Um, so okay, so with playtesting Absolutely, the most invaluable part of developing a game is the playtesting. And it's not just about did the game mechanically work. It's definitely uh, both sides of that. How were people feeling when they played it? And taking note, it's actually really great to take notes as you're, as you're playtesting. And, and note when people actually start to feel frustrated or when they start to feel excited or when uh, they're feeling good or when they're they're looking at their phone and bored out of their minds and being very cognizant of 
the emotional state of the people playing, because that is actually very, very informative about how engaging your game actually is or how well it's working. And often those, the mechanics and the emotional state of the playtesters actually are often connected. Sometimes mechanics are boring, so then they start you know, drifting off and then the mechanics start breaking because they weren't paying attention. And so there's this relationship between those two. So I, I, think, uh, you, I think you have to pay attention to both of those things. Um, in terms of like an approach to play testing, I think there are different phases that you go through when you're play testing. Like I said, the, my very first round of play testing was me alone, uh, where I could change rules on the fly and I could try new things out and I could, you know, it, it didn't matter if the game actually worked or if anybody else was happy while they were playing it. Um, I only really started bringing people in when I felt confident enough that the game would actually function and flow, even though there might be flaws. Uh, that it would still actually be a decent enough experience for another person to interact with. And that becomes especially true when you stop playtesting with loved ones, friends, and family that you can kind of rope into your little scheme here and you start playtesting with uh, other game designers or playtesting groups or strangers or you know how, who, whomever you're playing with because you especially want your game to be smooth enough and refined enough when you hit those groups, because all it takes is one bad play and they're like, I'm never playing that game again. I'm not touching it again. I'm, I'm out. Right. And it taints, it taints, uh, their, their view of it forevermore. So, uh, I think it's really important to start small and, and make sure that, uh, you actually have something that works before you try and rope, you know, a big, a big play test together. And, and then I don't know, uh, it's always that, that terrible feeling when you sit down at a play testing session and the designer says, well, I made this last night and I'm not sure if it's going to work, but let's play. And you're like, what am I doing here? Like, you've got to do the footwork before you start roping me in to uh, give you feedback because you need to do some of that work yourself. So, um, and then, well, we can play testing later. I think there's more questions on it. So let's move to the next one. Which player count do you test first? Hmm. Well, uh, with Oros, it was always, I, I played as a three and four player. That's where I started with it uh, because I wanted to make sure that I had a really, really well-oiled and beautiful three to four player game. Um, from three to four players, once that really started to even out and balance and feel very comfortable, then I started working my way down. I think there's probably other games that would probably be developed best the opposite way though, like starting really small and scaling it upward. I think it just depends on the game. So. I don't know. For Oros, though, it was always larger player counts that I was always playing with first uh, because of the systems of the game uh, kind of required th that many players. And then when I started working on solo and two player, uh, the, you know, the solution actually ended up being uh, the same for both, uh, that the, they had affected both of those. And so it was a matter of like dialing things in for one player and for two player and making sure that those two things, the same system could work for both and it would be uh, uh, as close of a play experience as possible as the three to four player. Next question. How did you go about balancing the game and the end game scoring? Oh boy, end game scoring. I went through so many different uh, approaches to scoring in the game. I, at one point I had like this this bizarro abacus like scoring thing, which made no sense to anybody. And then I had like, you know, a big long track where you're just kind of like working your way around the board or you're working your way on this long, long trail and whoever's in the top is the winner. And, uh, honestly, uh, it, it, it always was a point of friction for me because the scoring always felt like it was just tacked on. And you definitely feel that when you play a game and you know, the game's pretty good, but the scoring is just completely arbitrarily off to the side. It's like an annex to the game itself. And it was never like fully integrated into the game. And that was always some, this bit of tension for me uh, personally, where other people, they, they kind of looked past it and they'd say, Oh, you've got to finish game. And I'd always say, no, scoring is not right. It doesn't, it doesn't work yet. It's not there yet. And so that was always one of those things that just really dug into me at least is the end game scoring. And honestly, it didn't become balanced until I completely changed a critical game mechanic. So uh, it was never something that I was able to just like tack it on and tie it, tie it together or something like that. It was, it was, 
I, I completely changed, went from cards to the player mats. And once I had the player mats, it was, it was just clear as day, exactly what needed to happen. And the scoring became meaningful. It became integrated. It was part of the game. It was, you were actually in the game. It was in the game and uh, it became so tied together with exactly what you're doing while you're playing that you no longer needed this long little track that you're climbing up or these arbitrary little annexed tacked on things. Uh, it, it, it was, it, it was very natural. The scoring became natural. And so, uh, it took a long time though, a lot of play tests, a, like a lot, a lot of different ideas and no, I'm not happy with that. Try, try this and try that. And it took a really long time. Uh, but once I changed a few mechanics, it fell into place and it actually helped to also balance, balance the whole game. So, all right, next question. How do you know when you are done and stop tinkering? I don't think uh, any creative is ever done with anything they ever work on. So um, I think uh, though there does get to a point though where uh, like when you're play testing, it's almost like you're in a a boat, uh, a hole filled boat or something like that, right? And you're on one side and you're plugging these holes and you're looking on the other side and you're like, oh, oh man. And you run over there and you try to fix those things. And by the time you get that all settled, you're looking back the other way and you're like, I have to run back over there. And, and for a while there, you're just kind of trying to fix little bits and little bits. But at some point, the boat stops linking, leaking and it starts floating on its own. And there's like this, this, this moment when you're like, okay, I've, I've done many play tests now and there haven't been major changes so i haven't had to make massive uh, mechanical adjustments it's actually floating on itself and that's when you stop and you look around and you say oh man this thing's in pretty bad shape i gotta sand this thing down i gotta uh, wax it up oil it paint it or whatever it is that you need to do to a boat to make it all polished and, and feeling good and more elegant right you get to a point where you stop you stop uh you're kind of done with the bigger stuff and then you need to start tinkering on refining every last little edge and so it's just this beautiful elegant ship wow metaphor included on that one there we are all right next one the prototypes look beautiful where did you make them uh in china however blah, blah, blah. and how many prototypes did you make etc all right here's my deep deep dark secret of all the images that you see in social media, on the website, or any places around the web, for the most part, those images are not photographs, they are renders. And so um, I actually use Adobe Dimension to render uh, the game. Um, and the reason why I do that, well, actually, okay, I should say this, I'm not a 3D modeling person. I've tried to learn, uh, What's that 3D program? Like my, no, uh, Blender. I tried to learn Blender probably like six different times and it is just gobbledygook nonsense to me. It makes no sense how all that is put together. I'm terrible at it. But fortunately, Adobe makes a fancy little uh, app called Adobe Dimension. And it is a 3D modeling tool for dummies like myself. And so I actually use that and it does this fantastic job. It takes a little, uh, you have to kind of, figure out how to make it work for you, but it's super easy to use and it makes these beautiful images. And so actually most of the artwork that you see is not actual prototypes. Now, when it comes to prototypes, I did make physical prototypes and those that's what was sent around to different reviewers. So if you watch any reviewer videos, they'll be using those prototypes. They're actually made almost over six months ago. So they are now <laughs> a little bit out of date um, because I've made uh, still more tinkerings and more adjustments to the player mats and small little mechanic changes. Um, but those prototypes were actually handmade. So I didn't actually get them made by the game crafter or uh, a, man a Chinese manufacturer or anything like that. I made them by hand. So all of the board components are printed out and then mounted onto chipboard. And then I have this wonderful neighbor who is super kind and owns a Glowforge who spent many evenings laser cutting out all of the game board components, all of the wooden components and laser uh, etching the little symbols and stuff into them. And then uh, I spray painted each of the pieces individually. So they're all the right colors. And also the boxes were made with uh, a good friend of mine, Ammon Anderson, who was kind enough to come and make a whole bunch of boxes, which we used uh, printable vinyl. 
for the artwork on those things and then wrap that around the boxes, which by the way is the way to do it because it has great fidelity, but also it's like waterproof and it's very moldable. It, it makes a really beautiful looking box. I think it's one of the hardest components to make. But anyway, all of the prototypes I've made are actually all handmade. And uh, I have to have a video on the YouTube channel here where uh, I walk through the whole process. I'll show you how the whole thing's done. So jump over to that video if you're interested. In it. I'll put a little thing up in the whatever corner and then uh, you can watch it. All right, next question. Which programs do you use for the illustrations and graphics? Okay, well, as a professional graphic designer, I have full access to the entire Adobe Creative Suite. And that, I mean, I feel very fortunate that I do. And so everything that is made with the game creatively is all within Adobe. So all of the illustrations are created. I, I, I illustrated all of them myself using the very painful and archaic point and click with a mouse method, but that's the way that I uh, illustrate because I'm very precise and you know, doing things by hand with a sketchy tablet thing just doesn't work for me. So all the illustrations are made in Adobe Illustrator. All the graphic design work is all within Adobe InDesign. As I said, the renderings and you know, those, those visual renderings are all within Adobe uh, Dimension. And then color adjustments and retouching is all within Photoshop. Uh, this video is all edited within a, edited with, within Premiere Pro. All the audio is within Audition, and all the animation work is with Adobe After Effects. It's a whole bunch of Adobe stuff. So I'm kind of using the entire gamut. Uh, even all the web graphics, things like that, it's all in Adobe XD. So there you go. It's the whole Adobe suite that I'm using here to create all this stuff. Next question. How many prototypes or versions of the prototypes have you worked on? Oh man, so many. So at first, I actually started with physical prototypes because I didn't think any differently. This is the first time I'd ever done this. And so, like I said, cardboard, that was the first way I did it. Um, and then I moved into uh, just making like rudimentary artwork and rudimentary graphic design. It wasn't, it wasn't really polished or refined, but it was good enough that um, I could make it was more just like sheets of paper, cardstock, and whatever cut out. And then I went through this whole phase where I was creating cards, double printing cardstock, and then laminating them. And then very quickly I realized that was a terrible, terrible idea because one playtest, and then I had to remake them all. And that uh, is not a very uh, sustainable way of making a board game. And so for many years, though, it was all photo physical prototypes, and I probably made four to five prototypes. Uh, and, and then with different things glued on and patches and Sharpie marks and all over them to try and augment them and make them last as long as possible before I needed to make a new one. And it was that way until really until the pandemic hit. And then like you couldn't play test in person anymore. And so I put everything on Tabletopia, which was probably the smartest thing that I've ever done <laughs> during this process. Because all of a sudden, and I, did, I had never grasped first off how massive the uh, the groups are for playtesting online, and that you can playtest not with just with local people or you know doing all that you can to round up your friends or join local guilds of people who will playtest together or things like that, but it's still what well, you're playing maybe you're you know you're playing your game maybe once a month, and so it's just a very very slow process. But when you move it online, all of a sudden I could playtest, I could make adjustments to whatever, upload it, and then play test again an hour later. And that was a game changer. It, it honestly changed everything. And all of a sudden, the number of play tests and as fast as I could play test changed dramatically. And uh, I might say exponentially, I don't really know. But way more play tests, way faster iterations, way more changes, and it cost me nothing. I didn't have to print out and bind and, and do all of this other stuff just to have a play test ready, all I had to do was upload a new file and push publish and it was ready again. And uh, that honestly, so if you count up all of the versions of all of the digital things too, we're talking probably like hundred, hundreds, who knows, because there's just every single play test, it was a new upload, change this little thing, upload, do it again. And uh, much, much easier, much faster, much better. All right, what did you use to cut out the printed boards? I kind of already talked about this. It was a Glowforge. After things were mounted, it was a laser cutter that cut out all of the boards for the pieces that went to the 
uh, the different reviewers and things like that. And I think our final question, okay, I know you're squarely focused on Oros and the Kickstarter, but what are you currently feeling about potential future designs and the future of Ash games? Great question. So I am 100% devoted to Oros, making sure that it is just perfect. I want this game to be so well put together and so elegant that uh, people are, love it when they get it. They're not just excited about it before because there's hype, but because it's it's an amazing game when it arrives. So I've been 100% focused on Oros and also on the Kickstarter, trying to make sure that it's the biggest that it can possibly be because the bigger it is, honestly, it's better for all of us uh, because we end up having a better uh, game out of it. We have more stuff in it. It's a better, higher quality. And there's, there's just all of these great things that come when uh, there's a lot of uh, support behind uh, a campaign. So, and really that comes down to I mean, all of you that are watching this video, if you've made it this far in the video, um, honestly, if you'll just, you know, click the little blue button in the invite on Facebook and, and bring people to the page or, or talk about it or share it, um, it makes all the difference because, you know, my, my little sphere of influence is about that big. Um, whereas our collective influence, which is just massive. And so, um, that's what I've been focused on hundred percent, but in terms of potential future designs, I do have another design that I've been working on. I'm really excited about that. I've completely just stopped <laughs> and said, I cannot possibly focus on this because if I do Oros will simply just fizzle out and it will never get made. It'll never get done. So I've completely just put it off. Um, and then in terms of the future of Ash, game, Ash Games, I've always uh, thought of Ash Games as more of like uh, the, the hope was in creating it's like a collective of creators, uh, designers, wizards, and who who could rely on support on each other and uh, b become bigger than our ourselves. Um, but for the time being, again, right now it's all about getting Oros live and get that out there, and before I can start focusing on building a, a bigger business or building other games. And I think that's it. We hit our bottom. Hopefully that was great. And we'll do this again another time. Until then, keep playing.